motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to the School for Mothers podcast, Claire. I am so looking forward to this conversation. It's a pretty hot topic, isn't it? It really is. Hello. Hi, Denisha. Really lovely to be here. You know, we're quite often in clubhouse rooms, aren't we? And and actually, our worlds collide quite a bit. So you and I have talked quite a lot about this subject, haven't we? And and so let me go back to when you came up with the idea for, you know, the business that you do, and why? Yeah, of course. And, and we have, you're right. Um, so it's one of those things that I don't think ever just started. It, it crept up on me, right? So, and people say to me, when did you start to get interested in this? Like, was, it, was it because you were having your own children? And I say to people, actually, I look back and I think, well, I was the girl at 13 years old who was petitioning the headmaster so that girls could wear trousers at school. So hmm. this has been around for a long time. This, this has been a part of me, I think, and that kind of feeling of fairness and things like that has always been part of it. But I guess there was, there was a catalyst, I guess, and then a trigger probably. So the catalyst um, was when actually I started to buy clothes for my, child, my friend's children. Um, they were starting to have their kids and I was obviously out in the shops and I walked into a world that I, I mean, I knew it was there. But it was so stark, this pink blue world. And and I didn't want to buy pink or blue. And I was left with grey, yellow, or bunnies. And I didn't want to buy those either. <laughs> so I went on this mission for where are the colourful kids' clothes or baby clothes? Um, so that's where this started. Um, and then I started mm-hmm. to look into a bit, and then I started to do a little bit of blogging. Um, and then at the time I was working at MNC Saatchi, I was a managing partner there. And I spent a lot of time both with our senior clients and internally talking about where are the senior females, because we knew there was an issue. And some of our clients, really big clients, were, had initiatives about women in business. And we're not talking about CEOs here. We're talking about middle management level. And so, you know, mm. what can we do? How can we make this change? And at the same time, we had government and charity clients who were telling us that they were seeing the highest young male suicide rate they had ever seen. And of course, we were tackling that again at that you know early adult level. And but at the same time, I was researching children because I was now starting to have my own children. And I was, I wanted to know: is this pink blue thing that I'm getting annoyed about? Is it something to be annoyed about? Is it something we need to change, or is it actually just some colours? And I'm getting my knickers in a twist over nothing. And what I found was it absolutely is something. And so that pink blue becomes the shortcut. So then I started to go, okay, well, actually, girls by the age of seven are losing their confidence. They suddenly believe that boys are better than them at pretty much everything. And by the age of seven, boys don't really have any language for any emotion other than anger. So we're sitting here in this kind of corporate world going, okay, how do we affect these challenges at adulthood? You know, women um, losing confidence, not being quite so senior and and men and the high um, suicide rate. And I was going, well, actually, we've already got issues by the age of seven. So surely we need to be tackling there as well. I carried on with my career. I went over to Virgin Group. I'm heading up brand and customer experience there. And then this was just niggling away at me. I was doing more and more research. And I got to the point where I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to make books, toys or clothes. Going into boy, to, into books and toys really pushed me over, I have to say. Um, toys, I mean, we know there are lots of gender disguised studies which show that people, they give what they think are boys and girls because they were dressed in a, and I'm using quote marks here, boy way or a girl way. Um, people who even think that they don't adhere to stereotypes will when they go into those um, environments and they will mm. give girls specific toys and boys other toys and they play differently. They play in a much more physical way with boys and not so much with girls. And then you get into books and books was where I got quite horrified. 80% of hero characters are male. 
uh, females often don't have speaking parts. If they do, they are generally lesser roles um, or they are support roles or they are carers. Um, and then when you get into diversity, then it gets really awful. 4% of heroes um, are black, Asian or ethnic minority. And so, mm-hmm. and you start to go, hold on. For me, the biggest thing was children are not seeing themselves or their family in books. That's a worry. That's a real worry. So I kind of went, okay, well, I'm not going to write books, make toys or make clothes. What could I do? We know that parents are worried about this. So Fawcett Society study, 60% of parents are worried about the stereotypes that their children are exposed to. So I thought maybe I could create the brand where people come to who are thinking about this, who don't want to shop boy, girl, because I think that's one of our big issues in society. It perpetuates that cycle of stereotypes and actually want to think about activity and attitude and have lots of great quality products. So that's kind of where not only Pink and Blue was born. Mm. There's so much in what you've just described, actually, um, from you know, the kind of your own young uh, expectations about what was possible for you and your peers with those trousers, you know, (laughs) through to your working life with, you know, whether, you know, where women were occupying the the spaces that they're occupying, the roles, the positions, um, and onto, you know, motherhood and actually the stereotyping piece and identity. And I was going to ask you, how, where do you sit? I mean, you talk quite a bit about stereotyping and, I, and you mentioned it. Is your business fundamentally about identity? And is this fundamentally, I mean, not just your business, because obviously the episode isn't about your business. It's about the general, you know, kind of parenting beyond the binary here. Is it about identity? It is, but I think it's more about individuality. Mm -hmm. So for me, what we do at the moment is we socially code our children. And so the moment they they arrive in the world, actually before, if you know the sex of your baby in the womb, you talk to parents generally talk to their children differently if they are a boy or a girl. We know that definitely as soon as they're born. We use different language. We use more emotional language with girls. We use fewer words with boys. Um, And then we look at what's around them. Actually, what we're doing is is teaching them what they can and they can't do, what they are allowed to and what they are not allowed to do. And by the time they start to understand I'm a boy or a girl, which is normally depending on who's around them, but kind of three, four years old, um, they they now already know the code. So then they go, oh, I understand why I'm being given these colours, these toys, the spoken to in this way, encouraged to do these types of activities. And so then they police. And so what you find at school is that that's when peer to peer policing comes in really heavily. And so and there is a real divide and there are lots of divides at school. I mean, often uniform divides anyway. OK, so we've already got a very clear you are that type of person. You are that type. And and so and that split happens more and more because now the children are policing it. And actually, so, so for me, this is about choice. If we remove all of those parameters, if we stop stop this, it's subconscious, right? You've already learned that that side of the shop is yours because it's kind of pink and pastel and that side of the shop is not for you because it's blues and dark colours. You know, that is a subconscious that you've already understood. Babies mm. are amazing at soaking up information. Their brain just literally absorbs, absorbs, absorbs. And what we all do, even as adults, is we code the world. So if we go to a different country, we are coding that that environment. What can I do? What shouldn't I do? What side of the road should I be on? Where should I cross? You know, what, how do I act when I'm in a shop? We're doing it subconsciously all the time. And that's what babies are doing. And so, so what we're doing is removing choice because as soon as we are there in a situation where what appears it could be choice, actually that shop has already decided that half of the shop will only have those products on and that half of the shop will only have those products on. So we've immediately taken away a whole set of choice. And it takes a very strong child to walk across that divide. And kids do, of course, some kids do, but the majority won't because it means that they have to do something very different. And most kids want to fit in. Mm. It's actually interesting as you talk, I was thinking, I was wondering actually about how many conversations you've been having with parents and children, particularly of of children who are non-binary and transgender children. I was wondering if, you know, what you found. It's So I have had some conversations. 
It's a difficult one because it's we're talking about from babies. And so and this is about letting the children just remove those kind of stereotypes. What I do know is that what children or, you know, older, they're older now, but when they were children and they were they were transgender or they may have not have realized at the time, what they found really difficult was the stereotypes. Yeah. Because it boxed them into a place that they didn't want to be. Mm. And but they found it very difficult because they were like, well, actually, I feel different. I like some of that, but I also like some of that. So what does that mean for me? And that mm. and that was the difficulty for them because they they weren't sure what they were supposed to do because then they felt like they didn't really fit anywhere. And that's that's such a horrible feeling, right? Well, exactly. Because actually they fit everywhere, right? All kids do. It's just that our society has created these quite rigid kind of, I guess, roads that you have to go up because you need to like this and you want to play this and wear this and whatever. And actually, that's just unfair because there's very few people, even if we look at adults, who go, yeah, I absolutely adhere to that particular stereotype and I never veer off it and I don't like anything outside of it. I mean, it's a ridiculous idea when we think about it. So actually, it was almost, it's the parameters within these stereotypes that had made it quite difficult for them. Yeah, exactly. Because we're talking about incredibly constraining categories of human beings, aren't we? We, we, You know, that, that, that then get, we get stereotyped and truths as if, as if pink is best for, for girls. Now we know that pink, pink was a color that, um, you know, Formerly, we'd identify as boys and men. Yes. Historically, it was a male color. It's not a female color, but it's being, co- you know, isn't it? It's been co-opted into femininity and and thereby the traits of that being weaker, yes. vulnerable, emotional, uh, you know, less, less than, in fact, less than the ideal human, which of course has has had a penis, which is a ridiculous notion that exactly. a, you know, an appendage, a piece of the anatomy would make a human being better. Yes. And it's just absolutely ludicrous. And, <laughs> you know, and, and so it's interesting when we think about, when you talk about babies and even in the womb, prenatally, you know, when we do a scan, Like we're looking for those pieces of anatomy that will denote that gender, that 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 then will denote what people go and buy in in the pregnancy, those those buggies that might have flowers on, or will they have stripes on, or will they be darker colours, or will they have, you know, will you start getting headbands for your little girl? I mean, I'm looking at little girls with headbands on going They've already got a constraining, tight bow on their bald head, you know, or little tufts of beautiful little hair, just like boys have. But yeah. they've got this a, a adornment on them. So we start adorning, yes. and prettying up females to look cute. Yes, <laughs> you know? absolutely, oh. absolutely, and to identify them. Right. So there's a real yes. People want to show that they've got, you know, either a boy or a girl. And it's, and I find that quite interesting as well, because I mean, my two, they were, they were bold till they were, I can't remember now, like really old, almost two, I think we just, they just didn't grow much hair until then. And, um, Mm. and so they were, they were often referred to as boys. So, and actually I just would let it slide until it was something that was very stereotypical. So I remember one particular episode, uh, my daughter was about nearly two and um, she's very, very active. And so she's jumping down steps and running up, jumping down, running up, jumping down, like four steps, so big jumps. And um, the, the, we, were in a, we were in a cafe and the, and the waitress came over and she said, oh God, he's so active, isn't he? And I just, I just kind of nodded and smiled. And then she came over again and said, God, it's just amazing. Boys are just like that, aren't they? They're just so active, just do anything. And I, and I said to her, she's a girl. And she said, what? I said, she's a girl. She said, she's a girl. I said, yeah. And she said, wow, that's so unusual for girls to do that. And I said to her, no, it's not. She's a toddler. She's doing what toddlers do. 
but just because of her activities and okay because she wasn't dressed in pink she there was just an assumption and it's because she was doing an activity that is deemed boyish and it's like but it's not every child will climb jump run fall all those things but by having that you know she's thankfully she was out of earshot but she's hearing that if she was around it she would have heard it and just that you can hear by the tone you know kids very good at picking up tone feel she would have understood a few of those words you know just those types of things that is enough for children to start to learn Ooh, maybe that's not something for me and that and that's not that's not great because it's it's everywhere that's the I guess that's the kind of scary thing about it I do think we can massively change it but it is everywhere yes it is everywhere from the minute that you give birth if you're in hospital uh, you know, to being given a pink or a blue little blanket or a, or a pink or a blue little ticket with the birth details on and the names. Mm. And so that follows from there right the way through so that all the, all the, you know, birthers, if you like, can look in, in there if it's a ward, uh, rather than a private room. You know, you can look and you can, I remember actually, Claire, I remember this, this big, um, with my third son. And I really wanted a daughter. This is, you know, I just wanted, I I, I was like, I really would like to raise a daughter. And my son knows, so this is not some kind of (laughs) confession. (laughs) You know, it's sweet. We talk about it. And, and, uh, and so I remember looking down this ward. I, was, I had the misfortune, actually, to be in this great big ward with, I think it was something like 27 women. I was like, oh, God. Yeah. Um, and the room was a sea of pink, mm. literally a sea of pink. And the day after, I got up and I think, it, uh, you know, I, 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 it's probably the blues of some kind, but my emotions were really, you know, the, the hormones were all over the place. And I looked up and I was like, Mine was the, literally the only blue little cot, little perspex cot. And I was like, oh, oh. And, and I caught myself and I had, a, I really burst out crying. I caught myself and I was like, you ridiculous woman. This is a beautiful, healthy little boy. I mm. so love him. It's called Jack. And I was like, I love him. And, but I allowed myself to have that ridiculous moment of, yeah. you know, just a bit of grief that I thought I would never have a daughter. Yeah. Um, and then it was the only way I knew. Had that not been like that, I wouldn't have had that early kind of disappointment. I mean, so many, so many actually comments had been like, oh, you'd better have another, you'd better have a girl. Let's not have another boy. You know, so yeah. much opinion about this that I think I'd got to a crescendo of giving birth and, you know, and there it was. And I actually knew he was a boy before I was having him. So it wasn't a big surprise. Mm. But all of that, there's so many markers along the way. It starts so early and it's continual. It really is. One of the funny things when I was, when I had my triplets, I put them in a twin, a a twin kind of um, carry cot pram because they were so tiny and I could get three of them in. They were absolutely minuscule little thing, micro premies. When they come out of hospital, I put this, them in this thing and people would look in. I'd kind of say, no, not too close, thank you. <laughs> you know, like, keep away. They're quite little. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, politely saying F off. But they'd look in and then they'd go, oh, they're all the same. And I'd say, yes, yes, they are. What, what do you mean? And people would argue with me. I mean, one of them is female mm. um, and does identify at this point in her life as a female. Um, that, but people would argue with me. They try to guess who's female, who's male. I was like, oh. they're all in yellow or something. You know, I didn't put them in pink and blue. It was like all in yellow. Why does it matter to you what's inside their nappies? Mm. Why? Yeah. And I think that's it. Why do we have so much investment in making sure that we understand and constrain and constrict certain human beings from being something one way and others therefore have to be another way. Um, Why is that? Why have we got this investment? 
it's uh, I find it fascinating as well. I mean, from a neurological standpoint, um, what's interesting is, I mean, there are lots more studies being done now, but certainly when they look at the brains, when to, when babies are born, brains are pretty much indistinguishable in terms yes. of you know, how they work. You're not seeing differences at that point. Um, Absolutely. And, and actually what what they're finding is and Gina Rippon is an amazing scientist looking into all of this that actually it they you learn differently so you're they're sponges right and they can change so the brilliant thing this is what I love about this area is that we can change this because the the brains are malleable so all of our brains are malleable but they're much more malleable when you're kids so actually we can retrain all of these stereotypes and actually change it and that's and there have been studies done and experiments done I say experiments sounds awful but you know in (laughs) schools challenging stereotypes you know teaching parents and teachers you know looking at the type of language the books the way the classroom set up and actually what happens is you can change that in as little as six weeks you can start to challenge those stereotypes and change you know the language that that um boys have for their emotions their emotional literacy the confidence of girls you know the different skill sets that the kids have you can change it all so this is brilliant so you can do that one really interesting thing, and it has been an obsession for hundreds of years, right? Difference between male and female. Yes. So, and Cordelia Fine, another amazing scientist, she's done a lot of work on this. And she has said that when you go back to all those historical studies, there is so much emphasis on finding the difference. So she said, you might have two bell curves and they are pretty much overlapping apart from a tiny bit of difference. And then the focus is on that difference between male and female. And she said, so they've ignored all the similarities and literally focused in. But if you took a bell curve of, say, my brain and your brain, Denisha, there would be more differences than if you took the general male and general female. So so actually, it's this kind of focus on this what's the difference? And look, when we get to puberty, of course, a whole load of hormones kick in and that does change us. That changes our body shapes. It changes our strength ratios, you know, and up until that point, actually everything's really similar, you know, boys and girls, similar strengths, similar speeds, all those things. It's, it's when you hit puberty, of course, then there is differences. And what that effect has on the brain is a different, that's a different set of studies, which I haven't gone into hugely because I spend all my time looking at kids stuff, as you can imagine, mm. and reading those studies. But, um, but, but there has been this obsession. And part of it, when you look back, was in order to make sure that women were not able to have all of the things that men have. Men, men were ruling the world, right? And actually... If you acknowledge that actually women are just as good, just as bright, just as physically active, just as all those things, then where does that put you? Because now they have to be equal, right? So so there is an equality piece going back. So a lot of the focus would have been about how can we make sure, how can we prove that women shouldn't vote? Because actually, oh, their brains are smaller. Well, therefore, yes. that's, that's why that's why men are much more intelligent. You know, all of these types of things, they all played into that narrative. Right. We haven't removed that narrative yet because we you know, we still teach boys brilliance, which is a, a terminology of them. They just they know that they are better than that's why, as you talked about exactly girly, that's a pejorative. You know, it is it is not a positive if you tell someone they're girly. So we're still there. Right. We're still we're still fulfilling that kind of prophecy of of men are the most important they run everything they do those things which is back to why I'm always like we we we're fixing we spend our time at the moment fixing we'll fix this we'll we'll fix the confidence we'll you know fix the emotion emotional literacy we'll fix this at a much older age actually let's stop fixing stuff and let's just start from birth and not have these things and then we won't need to fix it all. So, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I completely agree. And and so we're the the world is attempting to remedially fix women still, as if we are lacking something. Yes. And 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 that's going to change. That's that's a strong hunch that this is on the on the change. Yeah. <laughs> we know that. Uh, and, and there's so much growing recognition that that men are 
needing to catch up in some development terms. Yes. You know, certainly, uh, um, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. But it's, you know, it's why, why have to remedially do anything about this later in life? Why not just, you know, kind of get rid of this, reduce the, the impact of this, this behavior, this, st- well, it, it translates into behavior, doesn't it? But these, yes. this mindset about, about being male and being female. I, I want to come back to something you said though about boys don't have the language for any uh, emotion other than anger. Mm. And I, I saw, I saw when you mentioned it in a, um, a social media piece a while ago and quite a few people jumped at you. And I, I said, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's what happens, isn't it? When we put, when we put our opinions out there, when we put our thoughts out there, our thought leadership, I mean, that's exactly what will happen. And I know because obviously I've got the book out. So people will, people will disagree. And I'm, when you put it out there, I went and I talked to my two boys and I asked them about emotions. Actually, they came to anger really late in their expression of emotions. And I was wondering, because it's less about the, it's less about the credential, the credibility of what you've said. It's not about that. I'm curious about how we talk about this, how we, how you're navigating talking about this without actually embedding it further. Yeah, because what you have to do is say, well, the study says this, that actually, you know, boys typically don't have language for any other emotion than anger. But by saying that, you're actually further putting it out there. Yeah. Cause some people won't hear the rest of the sentence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, because actually it's not necessarily a truth, is it? So not all. I think that's the key thing, right? Studies are there to find out what is generally a situation. Um, and also the people who are thinking about it and are and are absolutely kind of you know in their children's lives and teaching them these things, of course it's very different there. Because, I'm a convert, aren't I? You know, I've been doing this for years. <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's it. And you know you know about all these things and you are aware of what some of these kind of stereotypes, and even if at that point you wouldn't have called them stereotypes, but what that where that could lead. Mm. And also you are all about, and lots of parents are obviously about equality and making sure that the role models in the house and things like that are shown. Yes. Um, so absolutely studies are kind of, they're, they're generalizations, right. To show a theme. The thing is that is, that is a worrying theme that you see across the board. And if you talk to any of the organizations who work in schools around this particular area, it is a key one. And there are lots of influences to that. And and it's not just obviously parents, we counter as much as we can. But, you know, some of the other things I put in there, you know, 90% of, of the children who are shown with guns in toy adverts are boys. 97%, sorry, 97%. So, mm-hmm. so the, and, and if you look at any you know, any of the cartoons, if you read the books, who's doing the fighting, right? So there's, there's an awful lot of, of everything out there. And, and you're right, it's not, this isn't just about that. This is about so much more. And it is about, you know, actually emotional literacy, rather than we know that if children can name the emotion of the all of the range of emotions, they can control those emotions far better. Yes. Um, But we also know that men who absolutely adhere to and believe in stereotypes are more likely to be violent to women. So, so it does matter that we are challenging these and are from a young age so that actually those stereotypes don't become part of the norm in every day and that there is emotional literacy um, to, to help counter those things that could become more of an issue because of society and everything around them and the types of toys and and um, stories and cartoons etc yeah it's absolutely crucial that we you know confront and unpack analyze do something about this absolutely it's not it's a conundrum of how we describe things without making it even worse yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah, something totally. that I'm really attending to in my in my writing, in my conversations. I'm like, yeah, 
because partial and I, you know, my my sons are different in that sense. They don't adhere to the results of that particular study. That wouldn't be a big surprise at all. You know, I wasn't surprised. I, I would have been shocked if my sons had said anger and nothing else. I'd been like, wow, Danusha, you have not been doing your job here. <laughs> you know, wow, you have, gosh. And I would have known anyway by their behavior. Yes. Yeah, I really would. I would have known by not just the expression of a description of an emotion, but actually how do they behave? Yes. Are they anger fueled? Are they, do they present as little people, little human beings through the lens of anger? And I think that's a really interesting place to look. You know, what's the range that our children are expressing? What are they, what do we, what do we allow? Because we do allow or not. You know, I, and I have a, I've been watching my uh, daughter triplet, Serafina, who is, I mean, she's in her podcast, she has uh, an episode called Farts. We don't call them farts in our house. And she's like, mommy, would you mind if I, I had a, I want to do an episode. She said, I want to do one. And when she saw my face, when I heard the name, she, was, she said, do you mind? And I said, well, what are you doing with it? And she, <laughs> so she told me. And the reason that I raise this is because there is this underlying, almost like uh, avoidance of talking about wind and flatulence and farts with girls. Yeah, boys can fart away. They can be loud. They can be smelly. They can be, you know, there's this, and I have six sons. So, I mean, I know how boys are around farts. It's a badge of honor. You know, they like doing it. Apparently. (laughs) Apparently. So, with the girls, though, they, they behave differently, yeah, that I've raised. And I obviously know a lot of girls and their friends. So, and I am one, so I know how I was. And I was like, okay, what is this about? And she is the biggest farter. She won't mind me talking about it because she's already made it public. <laughs> she wears it. She's like, yay, that was a good one. Oh, did you get that one? I mean, seriously. She'll say, listen up, everyone. I've got something to say. And, and I'm like, What? what are you doing? And I laugh. Yeah, I laugh. I laugh about it I, rather than what stopped doing that. Yeah. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because the boys are policing her. They're literally saying, don't do that. That's really, I'm like, no, no, it's okay. Yeah. She, she Actually, she does it way more than them and she's prouder than them. And it's, and I'm joyful about this. Like it had not occurred to me that the very act of farting yeah. as a female would be a radical act. I know. It's an activist. So. Yeah, it is. It really is. And and it's mad, isn't it? That isn't it's, it mad? That it's so different. And it's back to that, you know, subconsciously or sometimes consciously, girls are taught to be quiet and listen and pacify. Pacify is a big one. Yep. Comply. Um, Comply. Yep. Smile. Mm -hmm. And, and, and generally not be the person who is, who's taking up space in the room. Yes. And, and again, I mean, but we're back to not all girls, of course not. But the reality is that is part of the way that our society is teaching our, our children. And I think there's also some quite interesting studies that look at how are children with their parents and how are they not with their parents. Yes. And actually, children are more likely to show all those different range of emotions and do all those things with their parents if they've got a really good relationship with their parents, obviously. Mm. But outside of that, then they are more likely to to actually kind of contain some of those because because they're back in a place which is I guess more there's more judgment in those places than in your own home with your you know your your kind of trusted close family um so so there's all sorts of kind of levels and and differences to all of this as well it's not just you know one person we know this the thing for me is I always think back to how are we as adults and and we are different in different places aren't we 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 mm-hmm. kind of we we're more likely to do something with certain people and less likely to do it with others, and we act slightly differently. And you know, we might be more professional in that place, and and then literally roll around on the floor in in that place. That's fine. That's what we do. We're not expected to just like a certain set of things because we're male or female or whatever. You know, I don't know. You've got blonde hair, whatever it is. We we have different things that we like, but yet when it comes to children, we're very 
we're very, well, as we talked about, we've kind of got this track that they need to be on. You're a girl, therefore, no, loud farts, that's not for you. It's mm-hmm. like, but, but why not? Just as likely to do loud farts as, as the boy over there. Like, it doesn't, why is it acceptable there and not here? I mean, it's just, and when you break it down like that, just like you have just then, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it is because it's a bodily function. It's a human function. So I, I put her on a, a, well, actually I didn't put her on it, but I asked her if she'd like to do a, a course on um, at school.com, which I, I don't get an affiliate from, by the way, but I'm just like, yay. Um, it's a really good, it's a really good online school. And it was on farts and she was elated, absolutely elated. So she learned. So we used that activity yeah. Um, to, you know, talk about gender, to talk about, you know, what is appropriate? What isn't? Isn't that funny that we would think that actually she might not do it? And why is that? And then she went on and she learned about uh, mammals who, you know, which animals don't fart? Uh, do butterflies fart? Do, you know, which is which is the animal that does the biggest? And so she made it a factual thing and a, and, and a knowledge building activity that actually... I think it was something like twelve dollars. I mean, it was you know eight quid, nine quid. It was nothing big, but it was really important to normalise this in our house yeah. because because it was. And you're talking also about code switching, which is we know the we know the social codes, we know what's appropriate, we learn that appropriateness, and and so we switch. And oh my goodness, you know. Yeah females are girls are so good at knowing when to switch yeah. because of course she doesn't go to school making loud trumps in the corner no she i mean i don't think she does i, th- I think we've talked about this mm. um but but you know she knows that that wouldn't be appropriate yeah so she she knows the social context piece yeah but most importantly she's not adhered to that idea that that needs to spread across her entire life yes um, and dominate her relationships with, which I can remember getting terrible stomach ache because I was trying so hard in a in a, in a new relationship not to to have wind. I mean, like I yeah. mean, like pulling in, like oh, oh yeah. I mustn't let this guy know that this happens. I mean, how sad. Well, not sad. It was. It's. It was, it's taught, right? It's been all around you. That's, that's why you're at that point. I mean, sad, yes, as in upsetting that we yeah. are in a situation, yes, where, so, where, where we've literally got girls to or women to the point where they feel like they can't even show something that's natural. It's just, yes. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a far reaching conversation. There's it so is. many places that we could go. You know, it isn't, I mean, really what I wanted to established that is that such a deep conversation nuanced complex it's 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 well beyond the color of our clothes isn't it and it's an important place to look in the toys the books the yeah. you know the language we're using the tone we use yeah. the yeah the way we pray i mean ev- everything what we see is possible in activities what we suggest to people yeah. i mean it's i i actually i have to say i was talking with some DNI experts in a massive brand that everyone will know that are really at the forefront of progressive companies. And I won't name them because of what I'm about to tell you. And we were, they'd hired me in to do a, a, an IWD keynote speech uh, with their company. And it was a man and a woman who are heading up this particular um, area. And he was saying he couldn't believe when the pipes burst he went to uh, get his son and say to him, listen, I need to teach you how to do this. And he caught himself through this um, activity of teaching his son how to lag the pipes. And um, they're young teenagers, both of his children. And he said, he went, oh my God, why am I teaching him and not her? And he's, and the reason he told me was because he was saying how deeply embedded all of this is, even for someone who spends all his time teaching this, talking it, pushing it through in a corporate, <laughs> you know, and it was like, oh my God. 
So we do have to really unpack this consciously, don't we? And, and absolutely, and, and be compassionate because <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. And I think it, this isn't about you know a blame game of parents and why you're doing it like that. Not at all. It is. We've all been brought up in this, right? So we can all name all the things. I do all the time. I'm hyper aware of all of these things. And I'll think something and think, God, I can't believe I just thought that or say something or question something. And I'm just like, oh, I am so in this. And yet it's still there. Of course it is because we're all brought up in that way. This is about what are the little things? Once you're conscious of it, you can start to make some changes. You can start to think about the way that exactly what you said, the way that you talk the language you use what you encourage and -hmm. also what you reward because reward isn't just about you know getting something nice actually rewarding is about saying well done or encouragement or even to the point of the look yeah the look on your face Mm -hmm. because children again very good at reading faces so what babies have to do from the moment they're born as soon as they can see faces they're reading faces and actually so understanding that you know that smile when you're doing something that's a good thing and so and and again you can see the differences between what is encouraged especially at a very young age you know boys are as i told you know climb higher why you're not the top yet girls oh be careful don't fall and it's just you know even those kind of small things Mm -hmm. um but as soon as you're conscious and as soon as you're aware actually you see them all the time which means you can counter some of it. And you can change it. Mm -hmm. You can change it. What you, what you're aiming for is a child who isn't, isn't just taking everything as fact. So they might be in the playground and someone says, Oh, well, you know, girls can't have short hair, but, but what you want is the child who goes, Oh, okay, well that can't be true. Or maybe that's not true because I know that, you know, whoever it is, nanny's got short hair or auntie Sons has got short hair. Or, and so, so it's just the, just the questioning. All you want them to do is go, mm. actually, could, could that be, could that not be right? Could it be something else? And that's all you need. You just need them to go, ah, oh, okay. The world isn't exactly as I'm being told by certain people around. And if I want to have something, but that shopkeeper's telling me I should have it in blue, Actually, I don't have to have it in blue. You know, it's just, mm. it's just that, just that easing. This isn't about you've got to chuck out all your books, buy a whole new set of clothes, get them into something that's not stereotypical. If they want to go and, you know, play football, wear blue and love music, that's fine, you know, but just, they just need to be given some choice around that. So it's not mm. about a blame game. Absolutely not. We're all in it. Exactly. And it's that cri- those critical thinking skills that are crucial. Oh, Claire, I've loved this conversation. Thank you so much for Me too. for coming coming on the podcast and for opening up, you know, some ways to think about it. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, and I really hope you did, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts. Or email me on hello at schoolformothers.com. That's hello at schoolformothers.com. Well, that's all for now, listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic week. And of course, stay safe. Sending you lots of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 